Okay, uh, yeah, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Welcome for an hour uh, sixth edition of the GRSS Young Professionals and ISPS Summer Consortium, uh, Student Consortium uh, Summer School that occurred uh, in this year in a virtual uh, way. Uh, we will come all participants that joined our event and i will just uh start a short video from our sponsors the joe science remote sensing society and the international society of photogrammetry and remote sensing student consortium Good morning, my name is Paolo Gamba and I am the president for the year 2020 of the Geoscience Remote Sensing Society. Okay, so first of all, what is a scientific society? What is GRSS? So the scientific society is a group of scientists, researchers and practitioners with common interest and common framework for building a community. In our specific case, we are uh, people who are good dealing with theory, concept and techniques of science and engineering as they apply to remote sensing of the earth, ocean, atmosphere and space, as well as the processing, interpretation and dissemination of this information. So what are the activities of the IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society? Well, we have a number of publications, we support conferences, we have professional activities we have a number of information service and technical activities and education activities as well. We are a global community, which means that we are arranged around large number of uh, groups of people that we call chapters all around the world. We have currently more than 90 uh, chapters all around the world. As a result, GRSS disseminates premium science by means of its three main journals, which are the Transactional Geoscience and Remote Sensing, the Geoscience and Remote Sensing Letters, the IEEE Journal of Selected Topics in Applied Earth Observation and Remote Sensing, but we have also a magazine, which, by the way, has a very, very important uh, uh, role. We also provide opportunities to, for the different communities, like, for instance, the community working on image analysis and data fusion. We have also, uh, we also sponsor community-driven events, like uh, the very um, successful Earth Vision Workshop, but also the SpaceNet Challenge Data Challenges here, which is organized by SpaceNet. We support also community developed tools like the DESE website, which is data and algorithm standard evaluation website, and also activities related to RFI observations. So we also facilitate and connect. We have a number of activities at the, in, a, in our main conference. We have the so-called time events, but we also organize different events related to uh, connection with uh, companies, industries. We have a number of activities like for young professionals, for women in uh, engineering and in geoscience and remote sensing. And we share our knowledge on hot topics by means of distinguished lectures, lecturers and industry speakers. We have also a number of uh, uh, educational activities. This is one of them. This is basically, let's say, one of the many uh, different small uh, educational videos for uh, kids that we have in different languages. But we have also, in addition to that, a number of webinars, which are also for people who are not kids, about uh, remote sensing in different languages as well. Uh, we offer continuing education by means of webinars, which is especially uh, important and useful in this situation where we are not able anymore to move around the world as we were in the past. So we can support continuing education of students and young professionals through conferences, journals, our magazine, webinars and so on. We can promote capabilities of the different communities, algorithms, data sets, by means of the data fusion context, 
by means of dedicated events at our conferences, by means of the industrial distinguished lecture or industrial speakers. We help connect companies and young motivated people by means of the young professional event, by means of student grants, by means of the Thai Forum. And we make the different community of earth observation practitioner and researcher be aware of their and your topics of interest. So GRSS is actually a community of communities where we could together share and promote ideas, systems and data set. We can meet with other communities and gain from their perspective and we can build different collaboration to learn more from each other and to come together in conferences. Thank you very much and I hope you will enjoy this uh, summer school and all the interesting topic and talks that you are going to listen during these days. Hi everyone, my name is Cheryl Rose Reyes and I currently serve as the president of the International Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing Student Consortium. I am very happy to welcome you all to the sixth edition of the IEEE GRSS Young Professionals and ISBRS Student Consortium Summer School this year. To start this event, I would like to present a bit about the ISBRS Student Consortium. We are the official representation of the youth to ISBRS. We link students, young researchers, and professionals worldwide interested in photogrammetry, remote sensing, and spatial information science to promote their scientific and professional developments. We advocate imaging and geospatial science for informed, scientifically valid, and technologically sound observations of Earth conditions and trends that lead to improved and effective decision making. The consortium is also accepting registrations for individual membership. Please scan the QR code in this slide if you are interested to join us. I work together with members of the board of directors from all across the globe. Charles from Uganda is our vice president. Charmaine, who is currently in Ireland, is in charge of our newsletter. Mustafa, our social media administrator, is from Turkey. And finally, Sona from Azerbaijan is our web administrator. One of the major events that we host and coordinate every year are the summer schools. In 2019, the summer schools were in Uganda, Poland, South Korea, and Brazil. These summer schools provide international learning opportunities for students and young professionals at a minimum cost. This year, we scheduled three summer schools, but due to the COVID-19 situation, Two of them were postponed, and we are sincerely thankful to the organizers of this summer school for making this an incredible virtual event. This is the first ISPRS Student Consortium Summer School that will be hosted online, and as you can see, we have an amazing lineup of speakers who will deliver lectures on remote sensing and machine learning. The consortium currently hosts the virtual rooms and the webinar series to provide our community with more opportunities to learn and interact with experts in our scientific community. The webinar series was conceptualized in 2018 and we have organized webinars on Google Earth Engine, computer vision, and machine learning. The virtual rooms is an initiative to keep the members of the consortium connected during this challenging time and to help them navigate our changing lifestyles. All the resources for the webinar series and the virtual rooms are available on our website and our YouTube channel. We also publish an official newsletter called Spectrum, which covers the broad applications of remote sensing, photogrammetry, and spatial information science, and welcomes contributors from diverse backgrounds and disciplines. We publish four issues a year, and our most recent issue is related to the current pandemic and the significance of geospatial information in tackling the impacts of this global health crisis to our society. The ISPRS Congress is one of the biggest gatherings in our scientific community, which is held every four years. The Congress hosted a virtual event for all papers submitted this year and postponed the in-person meeting for 2021. During the Congress, the consortium will be hosting a three-day youth forum, which will feature the following activities, speed dating, technical sessions, 
a special session on women in remote sensing for the grammatry and spatial information science, a panel discussion, the general assembly for our members, a student night, another summer school, and we'll co-organize a mapping party. The consortium would also like to invite you to nominate papers for the Excellence Award to be given during this event. Please scan the QR code for eligibility and nominations. Also, please visit the ISPRS Congress official website for updates. Finally, I would like to invite you all to join our communities on Facebook, Twitter, and to visit our website for all the information shared in this presentation. And again, I would like to invite you all to register as an individual member by scanning the QR code on the right. This is the end of my presentation, and I wish you all a meaningful summer school. Thank you very much. Well, I, in the name of the GRSS Brazilian uh, chapter, I must uh, tremendous acknowledge Paolo Gamba, who is actually the president of the Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society. And the second talk, delivered by Shelly Rose Rice, that is actually the president of the ISPRS Student Consortium. Well, I will hand now to Professor Galera Monico from the Sao Paulo State University, President Prudente, to conduct actually this the share, or to be the share now, officially, of this wonderful talk. I must also acknowledge Professor Dr. Christopher Roof, or Chris Roof, for accepting actually our invitation and for being here and sharing his knowledge and also his precious time. Professor Galera Monico, the room is now yours. Thank you also for accepting our invitation to be the chair, actually, of this talk. And I will let you actually the room to present also the lecture and the other colleagues that will support you in this sharing session. Thank you a lot, Calera, and the room is now yours. Thank you, Veraldo, for the introduction. And uh, I'd like also to congratulate you and your uh, team to, to organize this very nice uh, summer school uh, in Brazil. Uh, I'd like to introduce my two colleagues that will share this afternoon here in Brazil. First of all, hello everybody, good afternoon, uh, good evening, good morning, because a lot of people from the world is uh, taking part of this conference. We have the clock number six, and I'd like to invite Dr. Felipe Niewinski from Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, uh, Felipe Nevinsky is an expert on remote geodetic remote sensing, especially on reflect reflectometry GNSS. And uh, I also would like to invite Chris Lane Menezes da Silva, a PhD student at UNESP, work with multi GNSS positioning and ambiguity resolution. She will share the session with me. Hello, my friends. Thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Yes, thank you very much you for accepting uh, Chris Lane and Felipe. And now, let's introduce our speaker of this afternoon. Uh, I'd like then to introduce Dr. Chris Ruff. Uh, and, and also, I'd like to say thank you for accepting for giving this talk. 
Dr. Christopher Huff is from University of Michigan, USA. And he's going to talk today about the NASA Cyclone Global Navigation Satellite System Earth Venture Mission. Chris Ruff is currently a professor of atmospheric science and electrical engineer at University of Michigan. He has worked previously at Intel Corporation, High Space and Communication, at NASA JPL and Penn State University. He is the principal investigator of the NASA CYGNS mission. Professor Ruff is a fellow of the IEEE and former editor-in-chief of the Transition Geoscience and Remote Sense. Thank you very much, Chris. And then the room is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, um, I just want to check to make sure you can hear my voice. Is it OK? Yes. Here. All right, very good. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be able to meet with you, at least virtually, and share um, some information about the, uh, the NASA Cygnus mission that I'm the principal investigator of. Um, I'll start by just pointing out in this, um, in this um, picture here on the first slide, this is uh, what the satellites look like in orbit. They're in orbit now, today. There's eight of them in uh, a common orbit following after each other, sort of similar to the way this picture shows. And um, today I wanted to do several things in my description of the, of the mission. Uh, first, a little bit of motivation about the science that we were trying to do when we initially designed the mission and the way that the, uh, the science objectives influence the engineering design of the satellite and the sensors, the, the remote sensing sensors on the satellite, and also the mission concept, the orbits and so on. Um, and then I'll show you some examples of the hardware that was developed and the early orbit, uh, the early on orbit behavior of the hardware. And then I'll show you some of the scientific results that were directly related to the initial science objectives of the mission, which is studying tropical cyclones and hurricanes. Um, and then I'll show you at the end some new science applications that we started working on more recently um, that were not the original intent of the mission, but we found a number of interesting new applications for the, uh, for the remote sensing measurements for other uses in addition to uh, the hurricane science investigations. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of an overview of the, of the talk today. So um, yeah, the initial science motivation for the mission um, is uh, kind of nicely summarized in these two first slides. Um, these are slides that um, report on the quality of numerical weather forecasting by the United States National Hurricane Center. This is the part of the US government that is tasked with forecasting where hurricanes will go and how strong they will be in the future. And in particular, identifying where they will make landfall when they're coming across the Atlantic Ocean, where they will reach the coastline of the United States, and also how strong they will be as they reach the coastline. So this first plot shows the, um, the error in the forecast for the hurricane track. So hurricane track means identifying where the center of the hurricane is, the eye of the hurricane, and into the future. Um, and this is, uh, there's several things happening in this plot. Um, on the x-axis, this is the year in which the hurricane forecast was made. So the National Hurricane Center keeps records of the quality of their forecasts over time to see how well they're doing. And then uh, these different colors are forecasts a certain distance into the future. So this bottom one, the red line, is the forecast one day into the future, 24 hours, and then the green is two days or 48 hours and so on. And what this plot shows is that the forecast for the track of the hurricane, which is where it's going to be, have steadily improved over the last 25 years from uh, maybe a, 100 nautical miles. This is a, a, a one standard deviation error in the forecast. And um, more recently, the forecast error is about one half of the uh, of the error 25 years ago. So, so the quality of our ability to forecast where the storm will be 
and in particular where it will make landfall when it reaches land um, has steadily improved by about 50%. And this is very good news. And a lot of the reason, I guess there, there's two primary reasons why it's gotten better. One of them is the improvement in um, the numerical models. And a lot of that is because of the uh, improvement in, in computer capacity. You know, computers have gotten bigger and faster. And so you can use finer um, grid sizes in space and time to be able to more finely resolve the um, the you know the underlying physical dynamical variables that that affect the evolution of the storm. So better computers, better forecasts. The other thing that's had a big impact on this improvement is the quality of the remote sensing measurements by satellites, in particular, that have gone into the initialization of these models. Um, because there's um, more satellites in orbit measuring the Earth, and also better quality in the retrievals of geophysical parameters. And in particular, the geophysical parameters that are necessary to inform the forecast for where a storm is going to go are things that will affect the direction of a hurricane motion. And those are primarily environmental fields, not in the center of the storm, but around the storm, within a thousand kilometers or so of the storm. Things like the pressure field, the surface air pressure, the temperature of the ocean, or the steering winds, the background environmental winds that would push the storm one way or another. So those sorts of variables are well measured by the types of um, remote sensing satellites that have been flying and that are flying more now than they were 25 years ago. And all of those things have gone into the, uh, the positive impact on the quality of uh, hurricane forecasts for track. So a similar sort of plot is, of this is also maintained by the National Hurricane Center to assess the quality of the intensity of a forecast. And that's what this plot is here. So hurricane intensity is a measure of the peak sustained wind. It's the maximum wind in the anywhere in the storm averaged over one minute. And this is the number that's typically used when you categorize a hurricane, whether it's a category one, category three, category five, it's the, the peak sustained wind or the intensity. And what these plots show, they're similar plots over time and with forecasts one, two or three days into the future, what they, what they show is that there's been essentially no or very little improvement in our ability to forecast how strong a storm will be tomorrow or the day after tomorrow or the day after that. Uh, very little improvement in hurricane intensity forecast skill. Um, and uh, the probable reason why there hasn't been much improvement is because the things that will influence how strong a storm will be tomorrow or the day after tomorrow are very different than the things that will influence where it will go. You know, the things that influence where it will go are environmental fields away from the center of the storm that will steer the direction. But the intensification of a storm is primarily influenced by things happening in the center of the storm because that's where the energy comes for the intensification. And the primary source for energy with typhoons or tropical cyclones or hurricanes is the release of uh, latent heat in the atmosphere from evaporated water vapor. That's the primary source of energy. So what happens is the wind blows across the ocean surface and that wind causes evaporation of water vapor from the ocean into the air. And the more wind there is, the more evaporation there is. When water evaporates, it changes state from liquid to, to gas. And when it changes state, it absorbs or carries a huge amount of latent heat with it, the latent heat of vaporization. And then when the water vapor raises, rises up into the air and condenses back into a liquid and converts to a cloud and then rain, all of that latent heat is released into the atmosphere as sensible heat. And that, that heat that's released from the condensation of water creates wind. And that wind then creates more evaporation and a positive feedback mechanism. And that's exactly what makes um, hurricanes um, grow suddenly and rapidly is the positive feedback mechanism between wind, evaporation, latent heat release, more wind, and that cycle. So the right way or, or a, a good way to try to improve the forecasting of intensity is to measure something in that cycle, that energy cycle. And in particular, if you could measure the wind speed at the surface of the hurricane in the middle of the hurricane, you could then quantify the latent heat flux going up into the atmosphere from the evaporation 
and you could track the track the energy and track the intensification. So that's been it's, this has been recognized for quite some time that if we were somehow able to measure the wind speed in the center of a hurricane, we could improve the hurricane intensity forecast. And that's a very difficult thing to do for several reasons, which I'll get into in the next few slides. Um, so there's a number of ways that hurricanes are measured or tropical cyclones are measured routinely from satellites. And one of the most common ways is with optical and thermal infrared imagers. And an example of that is the, uh, these are GOES imagers. These are US National Weather Service satellites that are operated um, over, the, uh, over the equator in geostationary orbit. They have very high resolution visible infrared cameras looking down at the earth all the time, taking pictures often every you know, 15 minutes or so. And this is an example of an image taken by one of the, uh, the GOES visible cameras of a major hurricane. And you can see you know, the eye right here. You can see the spiral rain bands going out from the storm and so on. So these types of measurements are very good for localizing where a storm is and they can make frequent updates so that you can watch the storm moving. The problem with a measurement like this is what you're really seeing are the cloud tops because visible and infrared wavelengths can't penetrate through clouds because the, uh, the wavelength you know, at, in the visible and infrared is much, much smaller than the size of a cloud drop. A suspended cloud drop is typically kind of 0.1 to 10 microns, uh, and uh, the wavelengths are much smaller than that. So there's a lot of absorption, a lot of scattering, and you can't see through clouds. So you're not able to, from these measurements, directly measure the wind speed at the surface under the hurricane, which is what you really want and need to improve intensity forecast. So an alternative would be to operate at a longer wavelength to be able to penetrate through the clouds and the rain, and that's done in the microwave. So spaceborne microwave observations are able to measure surface winds and also measure the, the rain itself because there's some interaction with the rain. And an example of this is, uh, this is one picture, I think this is uh, the, um, the NASA TRIM satellite, which has a passive microwave instrument on it. And this is an example of the uh, the precipitation that's measured. So um, this instrument operates at wavelengths of about two and one centimeter. So there's it's able to penetrate through uh, clouds, but it, and it but it has some interaction with precipitation. So it can measure the rain itself. And you can see here's uh, this is the uh, snap uh, a measurement a data product from the uh, the trim microwave imager of precipitation everywhere in the world. And uh, for example, you can see the strong line of precipitation in the intertropical convergence zone near the equator going across here. And then there's some storms and some other features here and there. So this is a, a typical data product produced by the TMI imager on TRIM. And uh, there's, a, um, there's an attendant da um, data product that's also produced by the same instrument and that's the surface wind speed. And this is an example of that. Um, this is surface wind speed across the globe uh, measured by the TMI in, um, imager. And you can see things like there's some kind of cyclonic organized storm right here. And you can see some different features with different you know, weather patterns in the winds. So this is able to measure wind over the ocean, which is what you want. But there's two important problems with using this kind of data product specifically for um, uh, assimilation into a hurricane forecast model. One of them is that because of the wavelength of operation of these microwave imagers, there's still some interaction with the precipitation, which is exactly why you're able to retrieve precipitation. But when the rain is really heavy, um, and you know, raindrops, again, raindrops are typically kind of 0.1 to 5 millimeters in size. So it's of the same order as the wavelengths of operation of these sensors in the microwave. So because of that interaction, when the rain is really heavy, you can't penetrate through the rain, the optical depth is too high, and you don't get enough sensitivity of the surface to be able to resolve the wind. And you can see that in this image here, the regions in the wind image that are black right here, these are areas that are flagged out by the algorithm with a rain flag because the places that are black here are the same as the places here that have very high rain rates. You know, These red precipitation levels correspond to these blacked out wind speeds. And the reason is, there's too much rain and the sensor or the, these microwave frequencies cannot penetrate through the rain to see the surface. So it's just not possible to, um, to um, measure the wind speed in, in, the, in these conditions. And the problem is with hurricanes and tropical cyclones near the inner core of the storm where all the energy exchange is happening, there's always very, very heavy rain. 
um, that's part of the whole energy cycle with the latent heat being released and the water condensing back into rain. There, there's always rain. So you just can't use these kind of sensors to see wind in the center of the, uh, of the hurricane. So that's one problem with this type of sensor. Another problem is it's a little more subtle, but you can sort of see it in this, in this legend at the top here. This is a three day image. And what that means is there's a single satellite in orbit in a low earth orbit and it takes three days before the orbit starts to repeat itself um, as the Earth is you know, turning underneath the orbit plane. Um, so you don't come back to the same place on the ground until once every three days, typically. And so this looks like a snapshot of the rain everywhere in the world. And this looks like a snapshot of the wind speed everywhere in the world at one time, but it really isn't. This is a composite of data taken over three days. So, you know, the wind here might've been one day and the wind over here a different day. And it takes three days to fill the whole image in. And the problem is when you're trying to measure something that's changing quickly, like a uh, the rapid intensification phase of a hurricane, the 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 winds can change over a time scale of hours to 12 to eight to 24 hours that sort of time frame when the rapid intensification happens and if you're sampling once every three days it's very likely that you'll either miss the signal entirely or alias it because you're under sampling the dynamics of the change so for these two reasons the inability to penetrate through rain and the inability to make measurements often enough these types of sensors are not really amenable to assimilation into forecast models. So what's done practically to, to get around this problem is to operate sensors at even lower microwave frequencies or longer wavelengths so they can penetrate through the rain. The problem with doing that is as your wavelength grows with a sensor, um, the, the requirements on the size of the aperture of the antenna also grow because they scale linearly and it becomes impractical to put a big enough antenna on a satellite in orbit to get the necessary spatial resolution to be able to see the small features in the inner core of the storm. Um, so, uh, so to get around that, there's um, microwave sensors designed to measure hurricane winds at much longer wavelengths, lower frequencies, but they're flown on airplanes instead of satellites. And this is an example of something like that. These are instruments that are flown on a fleet of airplanes that are operated by the U.S. government, by the uh, combination of the the National Weather, the NOAA, which is the research branch of the National Weather Service, and also the U.S. Air Force has a number of these sensors on some of their airplanes to support the the needs of the civilian weather forecasting community. And these instruments, the, the, here's one of the instruments here. It's mounted on the bottom of this airplane here. It operates at uh, C band at way at uh, frequencies between four and seven gigahertz, so much longer wavelength. So they're able to penetrate through the rain and see the surface winds in, in uh, high wind conditions in a hurricane, but you have to be very low down in order to get adequate spatial resolution. And this is an example of some measurements made by one of these instruments um, with an airplane flying through uh, Hurricane Katrina. So here's the hurricane here. This white line is the flight line of the airplane as it passes through. And then these are the measurements, um, geophysical measurements of wind speed and rain rate retrieved by this instrument as it flew through the storm. And you can see, for example, the winds get higher and higher and higher, and then they fall off right here at the edge of the eye wall. This is the center of the storm, the eye of the storm with low winds, and then it goes back up again. And then the green line are the uh, spiral rain bands with the intense rain that are that's um, falling in these spiraling regions here as the as the airplane cuts across them. So these measurements are made routinely whenever there's a storm that's coming close to the United States. They'll fly these airplanes into the storm to make these measurements, and then the measurements will be fed into the numerical forecast models to improve the forecasting. The problem is there's only a few of these airplanes, they can't fly all the time, and they can only operate when the storms are reasonably close to the United States because they're based in the US in Florida. Um, so what you'd really like is to have this sort of capability, but on a satellite um, so that you can make measurements more often and, and globally. So in order to make the, these sort of measurements, you need to operate at a long wavelength. In order to make the measurements more often, you need to have a lot more satellites instead of just one that comes around every three days. And those two characteristics are really the heart of the motivation for the Cygnus design. We needed to have a remote sensing technique that can measure ocean wind at a very long wavelength so we can penetrate through the rain. And we also needed to have a technology 
that requires uh, that's small enough, low enough power and cheap enough so that we could afford to fly many satellites at the same time in order to get the sampling, the temporal sampling down to several hours instead of several days to be able to sample the rapid intensification phase of the storm um, with at the Nyquist rate. So that, that leads to uh, sort of the mission overview for Cygnus. Again, the, the motivation or the objective is to penetrate through heavy precipitation to measure wind speed, and also to be able to make measurements often enough to resolve the rapid intensification phase, which equates to making measurements every few hours. All right, and the way we did this, um, the design of the instru- uh, of the mission is we have um, eight small satellites in a low Earth orbit. They're at a low inclination, 35 degrees. So we don't, we don't go any further north or south than 35 degrees latitude because that's where the storms are, and. We use a, a new type of remote sensing technique, well, new for satellites. Um, use, it's a bi-static radar where we use as our transmitting signal the GPS navigation signals that are already there from, from the GPS satellites. And then each of our satellites carries a modified GPS receiver with, that's been modified to measure signals reflected off the surface back into space. Um, and this does several things for us. One of them is... GPS operates at a very long wavelength, 19 centimeter wavelength, 1600 megahertz, 1.6 gigahertz. So it has no problem at all penetrating through heavy precipitation. And you can see that with, um, you know, GPS receivers that are on your cell phone or that are um, in a car. Um, When you're using those and it's raining really, really hard, they work just fine because the wavelengths are so long. So we get penetration through the heavy rain because of this the signal that we use and then another nice thing about this technique for remote sensing is gps receivers are it's an extremely mature technology because they're used so commonly in you know cell phones and cars and airplanes and even satellites so the uh the electronics have been highly customized and or highly optimized for power and size so that they can be reproduced and, you know, you can build, you know, billions of them essentially on cell phones and so on. Um, And what that, what that gives us is these, you know, custom, they're custom ASICs. They're these custom computer or chips that can do all the processing required for very low power so that they could, you know, so they could work on a cell phone without running your battery down. And that lets us um, install these receivers on very small satellites because they don't require very much power at all. And, If the satellites are very small, then they're cheap. And because they're cheap, we can fly a lot of them. And if we fly a lot of them, eight of them in this case, that gives us the space or the temporal sampling that we need to capture the rapid intensification phase of the uh, of the satellite. So that's the sort of the background on the mission. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the phenomenology of the remote sensing technique. So um, the way this works, it's a bi static radar. The GPS satellites are transmitting all the time, sending their navigation signals down and, you know, covering the Earth. And then the Cygnus satellites up here are in orbit looking down at the Earth and looking for the GPS signals. And in general, with um, with radar scattering signals, a signal will go down from a radar, scatter off the surface. With most remote sensing ma- radars, they measure the backscatter signal. So they measure the amount of signal that comes back in the same direction. So the receiver and transmitter are here. But in our case, we're measuring the forward scatter or specular scatter where the GPS signal goes down. There's a spot here where the signal reflects back up in this direction. And we intentionally tune the satellite to look at the specular reflection point. This is the point where the angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. And the reason for that is the forward specular scattered signal is much, much stronger than the back scattered signal that conventional radars usually measure. The difference in scattering cross section of the back scatter versus forward scatter is about 30 dB. So the forward scatter signal is about a thousand times stronger than the back scatter. Because it's so much stronger, that allows us to have a much simpler receiver with a smaller antenna, lower gain lower noise sensitivity requirements, all kinds of things are much easier on the receiver because the forward scattered signal is a thousand times stronger than a conventional backscatter. And all of those things add up to allowing us to have a small satellite at low cost so that we can fly many of them. So that's the idea of bi-static specular scattered radar. So the way we measure wind with this is um, you can think of a specular forward scattering it's a similar phenomenon, whether it's at optical wavelengths or microwave wavelengths. So here's an example of 
specular forward scattering at optical wavelengths. This is just a picture taken of the moon. This is the direct signal, you know, the camera's looking directly at the moon. And then this little moon down here is a, re a specular reflected moon. So the sunlight goes down, hits the lake surface, and then comes up to the camera. And if you look closely at this uh, moon right here, it's almost a circle, right? Just like the moon here. And that's because the water is very, very smooth relative to a wavelength. And uh, if it was perfectly smooth, it would be a perfect mirror reflection, right? And you can actually see if you look really closely, there's a little bit of roughness around the edges here. And that's because this water surface is not perfectly flat at optical wavelengths, okay? And you could actually, if you analyze this, this image carefully, you could actually make estimates of the roughness statistics of the oceans of the of the lake surface just from the exact shape on that edge. Okay, so that's what um, specular reflection looks like at optical wavelengths when the surface is very smooth. When the wind blows, wind roughens uh, the surface of water, and this is an example of wind roughen reflection. So here's the moon again. Here's a roughened surface because the wind has been blowing. And instead of a nice sharp circular moon here, you get this broad region of diffuse scattering, uh, quasi specular diffuse scattering. And in optics, this is called the glistening zone. It's because the water sort of glistens from the reflections. And it's really because all these little facets of water are tilted in different angles. And that causes this um, you know, partial specular reflection from all these other areas. And the same thing happens if you think of it globally, GPS is scattering off the surface. If the surface is perfectly flat, all your reflections is going to come from that one red spot, the specular point. But when the wind blows, you'll get roughening of the surface and you'll get this expanded glistening zone around it. And you'll get more and more of the reflections from other places besides a specular point as the wind increases. So if you could Im image the scattering cross section of this ocean in the region near the specular point, you could equate that with the degree of roughness of the surface and from that you could get the uh the local wind speed and that's exactly how cygnus works and this is an example of that this is a measurement of scattering off the ocean surface of a gps signal so this is a gps navigation signal at 1.6 gigahertz 19 centimeter wavelength and it's um the specular point in this reflection is right here in the red part and all this yellow and green around it is diffuse scattering from the glistening zone because the water or because the air, you know, the wind is blowing and the ocean surface is roughening. So this is a two-dimensional map of the scattering cross-section in the vicinity of the uh, of the specular point. And these two uh, coordinates here, you can equate these two coordinates to position on the ground and lat latitude and longitude. But what they actually are, this axis here is the Doppler shift of the signal. So the, the signal, when it scatters off the surface, gets a different Doppler shift depending on exactly where it is because of the, uh, you know, Doppler is proportional to the component of velocity in the direction of propagation. And that dot product in the direction changes as you move around. So that allows you to isolate different places on the ground by the Doppler shift. So there's a, a bank of Doppler filters. It's just a, a FFT processor that processes different Doppler shifts um, individually. And then this axis here, the CA code shift, that's kind of GPS jargon. It's basically a range gate. So this is the propagation time of the signal. And the propagation time, um, the time it takes for the signal to go from the GPS to the ground to the receiver varies as you move around on the surface. The minimum propagation time is at the specular point. That's why this is at the top. And then if you use a longer propagation time, a longer range gate in the radar, you expand out in, um, in ellipses that go out away from the, the, the uh, specular point. So by varying the range gate in one dimension and the Doppler shift in another dimension, this is all done in an onboard processor in our satellite, you can essentially map out the scattering cross section of the surface in two dimensions, two spatial dimensions. And from that, you can derive the wind speed. All right. And this is an example of how that works. These are um, measurements. These are called delay Doppler maps. It's a map of the scattering cross section as a function of time delay and Doppler shift. These are delay Doppler maps for three different wind conditions. This is measurements made as we are flying over a buoy measuring the wind. And as you can see, as the wind gets stronger, the surface gets rougher and the glistening zone expands. The amount of reflection near the specular point goes down. The amount of reflection away from the specular point goes up. And by looking at the, the, the behavior of this map, we can estimate the wind speed from the data. 
And that's exactly what we do with the Cygnus measurements to make um, wind speed maps. So that's the basic remote sensing phenomenology for Cygnus for um, as a wind sensor. Okay. So very quickly, this is a this is a, an expression for the Ford model of, of our measurements. This is an electromagnetic scattering model, and uh, just to give you an idea of what it is we're measuring. So the thing we really want is the scattering cross section of the surface. That's this thing right here, sigma naught of s. S is just a, a parameterization of the surface location. This is a two dimensional integral over the surface of the of the ocean. This is what we're. This is what we want. This is what we call our level one. Uh, engineering data product, calibrated scattering cross-section. These are the um, one over R squared propagation losses because of the um, the propagation of the electromagnetic signal. This is the uh, the response of the um, time delay filter, uh, the range gating filter. This is the response of the Doppler filter to uh, isolate different spots on the ground. This is our antenna pattern, F of S. You do this integral and then these are, this is the transmit gain of the uh, GPS, the transmit power of the GPS signal. This is the receive gain of our antenna, the, the receive antenna. Um, these are some other calibration parameters. All of this stuff together gives us our measurement. This is the receive power as a function of time delay and Doppler shift. So basically, the left-hand side is the actual measurement that we make. And this term right here is what we need. To get in order to estimate wind speed, the scattering cross section versus position. Everything else in this equation are just a bunch of calibration terms that we need to correct for when we calibrate the data. Okay, so this is the input, the raw data measurement. This is the output, the calibrated engineering data from which we get wind. All right, so um, once we have the scattering cross section measured, um, and this is an example of one, we then estimate the wind. And the way that the wind is estimated is in, we have two different ways of doing that. One of them is, you look at the average power in this black box here. This black box is centered on the specular point right here. And as the wind increases, the amount of scattering that's in the box goes down and more of the signal gets scattered from all these other areas. So this region right here, it's monotonically inversely related to wind speed, stronger signal, lower wind speed. So that's one way of measuring the wind. And then another way is with the, uh, the waveform itself. So um, what this plot here is, it's called the delay waveform. And what you do is you take this plot here, this is scattering cross-section versus Doppler shift in this dimension and time delay in this dimension. And, <clears throat> excuse me, you integrate across the Doppler shift and that gives you a one-dimensional function of time delay. And that's what this plot is here. <clears throat> so, excuse me, so th it's the, uh, the received signal as a function of time basically the radar return pulse. Um, it's, again, it's just integrate this dimension out and you get a one dimensional function. And what happens is these different curves are for different wind speeds. As the wind speed grows, the leading edge of this, of this um, waveform decreases, the slope decreases. So when the wind is, when the ocean's very flat, you get a very sharp vertical return. This red here is very low wind speed. And that's because the surface is very flat and you get this nice sharp return. As the wind blows, the surface gets rougher and you get some scattering from the very top of the of the wave and some scattering from the very bottom, the, the trough of the wave, and the return signal gets smeared out in time. So by looking at the slope of that leading edge, it's also um, proportional to the wind speed. The higher the wind speed is, the lower the slope. So we have two different ways of measuring the wind speed and we use both of them in our retrieval algorithm. So that's the way we get wind from the data. Okay, um, I've all, ne next I've got just a handful of pictures of the hardware to give you an uh, idea of what this looks like. So this is one of the satellites being tested before launch. It's um, on a little stand. These are solar panels on the top that, have, that are folded up. This is the way they're folded up at launch. Um, solar panels on the front. Um, some The science antennas are on the bottom. This is a uh, GPS antenna here for measuring the direct signal for doing navigation. And then the science antennas to measure reflected signal are on the bottom. So that's what, what it looks like when it was being tested. Here's four of the satellites all together. This gives you an idea of how big they are. This is one satellite, another one, and then two back here. These satellites are, these four are being loaded into a, a thermal vacuum chamber. This, this is this great big tube here. It goes inside, we shut the door, pump out all the air, 
so that it's um, in a vacuum. And then we cool the whole thing down with liquid nitrogen. So it's very cold. So it seems like it's an outer space. And then we just let it run for about seven days to make sure that all the hardware can work properly in a vacuum. So this was a thermal vacuum environmental test that was done. And one thing I wanted to point out here is this yellow uh, rectangle right here. That's one of the two science antennas that looks down at the uh, ocean surface. It's a two by three phase array that looks down um, to, to get the reflected GPS signal. And then finally, this is a picture of the satellite, one of the satellites when we were testing the solar panels. So these are all, these solar panels are folded up. This is what the solar panels look like when they're opened up. And this is just testing the deployment mechanism to make sure it works. So this gives you, an, again, an idea of the size of the antenna. Okay, so this is um, one of the satellites all opened up and a few um, key um, performance characteristics. Uh, we have attitude control. Uh, we have no propulsion at all. There's no propulsion. We just drift along and that works fine for us. The total power for the entire satellite is about 38 watts, about 10 watts of this is the science, the GPS receiver. Um, the mass is about 25 kilograms and uh, you saw the size in that previous picture. Um, okay, so this is um, getting ready for launch um, on the satellite. So this thing here, it's called a deployment module. It's a tube that has little deployment springs. On, there's eight of these little deployment springs. The satellites attach to each one of these places. And then after launch, they're deployed or pushed out away from the top, the top of the rocket, the third stage of the rocket into their individual orbit. So this is getting ready to mount the satellites onto this deployment module. And then here's all eight satellites mounted on the module. Um, this, this little thing at the bottom is the attachment point that attaches to the top of the rocket. This attaches to the third stage of the rocket. And here's all eight of our satellites stacked up on top with the solar panels closed. And they're mounted behind these little deployment mechanisms that will push them out into orbit. And this, this is a test where we took all eight of them, mounted it on a vibration table, and then we shook it a lot to imitate the vibrations that are experienced uh, when, we, when we launch the rocket to make sure that mechanically everything is built, built well. And then finally, this is mounting the uh, eight satellites on the top of the rocket. So the rocket itself is back behind this sheet here. Um, going back that way, it's horizontal. And then these are the eight satellites being mounted on top of the third stage. And then this is a cowling that goes over the top of the um, the satellite um, just before we launch. Okay, so this is the rocket um, mounted on an airplane. So th these are small satellites. So we could use a very small uh, rocket. It's called a Pegasus. And this rocket is small enough that we don't really need, we don't need a major, a large first stage. You know, with big rockets and big satellites, you typically have a very large first stage engine that gets you just up out of the lower atmosphere into the stratosphere. Um, and then the first stage falls away and the second stage gets you up further up into space. Because these are so small, what we did instead to save money is we have a smaller um, rocket that's mounted on the bottom of an airplane, an L-1011 aircraft. Then the airplane flies out. Um, we flew out of uh, Florida, uh, Cape Canaveral Air Force Base. And we flew about one hour east over the Atlantic Ocean. And then this airplane just releases the rocket and it falls away from the airplane for about five seconds. And then the engines fire and it goes up from there. And these the, the airplane is at about 45,000 feet altitude, about that, like 14 kilometers or so. So it's out of the troposphere up into the lower stratosphere. And it's much cheaper to do it this way if you have a small satellite or, or even with, you know, there's eight small satellites right up here in the front here. And it's still much cheaper to do it this way than using a conventional rocket. Okay, so this is a video. When we flew the, when we launched the Cygnus satellites, um, there was the big airplane that had the rocket on it. And then there was a smaller chase plane that flew along below it just to make sure that everything was healthy before we released the rocket. And the chase plane um, had a, a, a high quality video camera on it that was filming the whole thing. And this is a clip from the chase plane um, as it was filming the release of the rocket and then the firing to get it into orbit. So I'll play this. LC, PLT, copy. LC, PEG, PEG is go for launch. PLT, LC is go for launch, PLT confirm. LC, PLT, PLT confirms go for launch. Drop on my mark. Three, two, two one. one. Drop. Go for release. Pegasus is away. And drop. Pegasus is away. LC, PLT. The ignition of the Pegasus rocket with Cygnus, helping Hurricane forecasters 
understand and predict the intensity of hurricanes. Okay, so that was the launch. That was the launch, and it takes about 12 minutes from the launch um, until you're in orbit, low Earth orbit, at 520 kilometers. And after that, um, after you're in orbit, um, you wait about three minutes to make sure that everything is steady and the rockets have finished burning and so on. And then you release each one of the satellites into their own particular orbit to spread them out around the Earth um, with that deployment module. So this is a this isn't a video, but it's a uh, it's a you know an artist's conception of the uh, of the release of the individual satellites um, into their different orbits. So this took this is what what, what happened about. 15 minutes or 14 minutes after the the launch that you just saw in the previous the previous video uh here we go right so they were re released in pairs so that the you know so the momentum cancels out so that the, the third stage doesn't move around too much and then soon a few seconds after they're released the solar panels open up so that the batteries can start charging and uh, they start orbiting along, and then over a period of a few weeks or a few months, really, the uh, all the each individual satellite settled out into the orbit that we wanted. Okay, and then once they had settled out into the orbits, then we started doing our science measurements, and this gives you an idea of how the science measurements work with the constellation. So this is one of the satellites here, the GPS, the Cygna satellites, and then these these um, blue ellipses are the specular point reflections from the GPS satellite. And then these ellipses below, these are our antennas, the science antennas looking down at the ocean. And whenever one of these specular points enters into our antenna, the onboard processor acquires it and starts doing all the Doppler shifts and the correlation calculations to measure the reflected power. And that's how we make you know, measurements. So each satellite, each Cygnus satellite has four GPS receivers to measure four different specular points. And that's why there are these four different lines coming out of each um, satellite. And then we have eight satellites. So there's eight satellites, each one with four channels. And if you add those all together, we're doing 32 different measurements simultaneously of the ocean scattering and the wind. And if you take all of those and piece them together, that gives us our, our global coverage. So this is what the coverage looks like. Again, you can see a 35 degree inclination orbit. These are measurements made along these lines of all those specular points um, from the GPS reflection. So that's the way the measurements work. Okay, so this is kind of a summary of what's happened in our post-launch activities. We launched in December 2016. We got the engineering um, calibrated and commissioned. We started doing science operations in March of 2017. We started releasing data that summer. We got the data calibrated, and our, our more formal release of data was later in 2017. Um, we reprogrammed our receivers in 2018 because we saw that there was a lot of variations in the gps transmit power which were affecting our calibration so we've corrected those and now we have a new calibration technique that dynamically monitors the changes in gps transmit power and does uh, calibration correction i'll skip over this stuff so here's um some examples of some of the uh measurements that we've been making with cygnus these are measurements of a hurricane hurricane dorian from last year these are measurements uh, by the whole satellite constellation over one hour as it passes by the storm. And you can see the higher red parts of the storm. And this is zooming in on it just over the inner core part of the storm. These are the winds right near the center of the storm. And you can see the times here. We go by th this area, we go by a couple times a day, sometimes three times a day, depending on the latitude. And uh, yeah, here's a, a particularly nice one where you can see the structure of the storm where it's really high winds near the center and the winds die out as you move out away from it. So these are the type of measurements that we're making of the hurricane winds. And now what we've done is taken those hurricane winds and assimilated them into a hurricane forecast model to see how much we can improve the forecasting of hurricane um, intensity um, with the data. And this is an example of some of those results. This is um, the wind speed predicted by the hurricane, the operational hurricane forecast model. This is the wind speed at three kilometers altitude, not at the surface, but at three kilometers, uh, predicted by the numerical forecast model. Um, this is predicted without Cygnus, and this is predicted with the Cygnus data added. And you can see that with, when you add the Cygnus data, 
the peak winds shift from here. The peak winds are due north of the storm. And here the peak winds shift off to the um, northeast. And the reason is we're, ba we're better able to monitor the latent heat flux of the evaporation off the surface so we can track where the energy is that's forcing the higher altitude winds. And the reason we picked this particular product, the three kilometer altitude wind is because, um, is because there was one of those Hurricane Hunter airplanes that flew through the storm at just this time, and it was making measurements of the wind at three kilometers. And these are the measurements that were made by the airplane. And you can see it has the same asymmetric behavior off to the northeast that was captured by um, the forecast model using the Cygnus wind. So that's a good indication that we have, you know, we're adding valuable information about the latent heat flux and the and the energy and evolution of the storm with the Cygnus winds. And this is one other example of that. This is um, um, estimating the minimum pressure in the storm, which is a proxy for the strength of the storm. And this red line is the estimate of the uh, the minimum pressure um, estimated by the operational forecast model, the National Hurricanes forecast model. This black line is the actual true pressure that actually happened. And this sudden pressure drop right here, this was the rapid intensification phase for Hurricane Michael. And the store and the intensification was was almost completely missed. There's a little bit of a dip here, but it didn't get anywhere near deep as actually happened. This is a typical example of a storm forecast that missed a rapid intensification. Um, this is the control when we use the standard operational forecast model. And this is the same model when we add the Cygnus data in. And you can see that we do a better job of tracking in the red here, the act, the deep intensification or the, the um, you know, the decrease in the minimum pressure um, when you include information about the surface wind. So that's a, a good indication. Okay. I wanted to shift gears here in the last few slides here and talk a little bit about other things that we're using Cygnus data for besides hurricane winds. So Cygnus is running all the time when it's in orbit and it's taking data, whether you're over land or over the ocean. And in particular, when you're over land, we're measuring scattering cross sections off the land surface. And there's a lot of valuable information that we can get about the uh, scattering from the land. And this is an example of some Im early images that we made of Cygnus over land. And I'm gonna show you three different examples of the same section of the Amazon River. So this is actually in Brazil. Um, this is uh, measurements made by three different sensors at the, that all operate at nearly the same microwave frequency. So this first one is a, is a measurement made by the SMAP passive microwave instrument. This is a, a NASA satellite that has a, a, a radiometer that operates at 1.4 gigahertz. So almost the same wavelength of frequency as Cygnus, but it has a 30 kilometer resolution. And this is, a, this is an image of a, a major section of the Amazon River with 30 kilometer resolution imaged at um, uh, microwave frequencies, uh, 1.4 gigahertz. So there's another instrument on the same satellite, SMAP. It's a radar that operates at 1.2 gigahertz, almost the same frequency, and it has about three kilometer resolution, so 10 times better resolution. And this is that same section of the river, um, and you can see much finer resolution. The spatial resolution is, is better. You can pick up some of the so small scale tributaries feeding into the river that you can kind of see here, but not so much. And in any event, you can see that this has much better spatial resolution. So this is three kilometers from SMAP uh, radar, three kilometers from SMAP passive microwave. And then we imaged the exact same section with Cygnus. And this is what we got. So you can see the spatial resolution with the Cygnus measurements is much, much higher than with either the radar or the radiometer, uh, much lower than three kilometer resolution. And uh, this was actually a pleasant surprise. We weren't expecting to see this kind of quality resolution in the forward specular um, direction. And it's because of this image and some others like it early on in the mission that we've refocused a lot of energy in the mission or added people to the mission to look at the land data because of the extra things that it can do for us. Um, the reason why the resolution is so much higher um, than those other techniques over land has to do with the difference between incoherent and coherent scattering. So um, incoherent scattering happens over the open ocean where the surface is rough and you have, here's the GPS transmitter, here's the Cygnus receiver and the signal goes down, it illuminates the surface and if the surface is rough relative to a wavelength, then every little spot on the ground you can think of as an independent radiator with no phase coherence. And the signal that's measured here 
ends up being proportional to one over r squared for this distance times one over r squared for this distance. And you just add the powers incoherently because the surface is so rough. If the surface is really smooth, which is what happens with inland water, like a river or a lake, the surface is much, much smoother than, an, than the ocean. And what happens is you get specular reflection and the, the dependence on range goes as one over the sum of the, the square of the sum of the ranges. This, this form here, as opposed to this form, uh, the dependence on range is critical because if you actually plug in the numbers for the range with Cygnus and the range with GPS, um, the difference between this dependence on range and this dependence on range is about 30 dB. It's actually more like 33, 34 dB. So what that means is the scattered signal from calm water, smooth water, is about 2,000 to 5,000 times stronger than the reflections from the ocean. It's really, really huge. And that's the reason why we can detect these tiny little water features, like these little features that are much, much smaller than a kilometer, stand out because the scattering from the calm water is thousands of times stronger than it is from the ocean or, or from the land around it, for that matter. So that's uh, it's a really excellent quality, um, it, um, you know, um, dependence that we can leverage. And an example of that are some land measurements that we made of a hurricane after it made landfall. Um, this is uh, Hurricane Harvey, which caused a lot of flooding in Southeast uh, Texas. Um, this is the land image by Cygnus just before landfall. And this is the land um, in the days after the hurricane made landfall. And you can see this area getting redder and redder and redder. And that's because of all the standing water from flooding. And one other example of that is this image, these pair of images here. There was a huge flooding event that happened in uh, November 2018 in northwestern Iraq. Um, and these are images made by Cygnus. This is made before the flooding event. And this is just after the flooding. And this region right up in here in uh, northwestern Iraq, right in here, you can see the color changes quite a bit to uh, from kind of reds to greens and yellows. And this is all from standing water from the flooding. So um, this is a, it's a new technique, a new capability that we're just starting to really leverage the ability to do high resolution images of inland waterways. And uh, let me just skip ahead here. I'll get just one last thing here, just uh, as a summary of what Cygnus has, has done and is doing. So we launched in December, 2016. Um, all eight spacecraft are on orbit now, taking data 24 seven. We're getting lots of data over ocean and land. Over ocean, we're making routine measurements of winds in hurricanes and taking the wind data and assimilating them into forecast models to work on improving tropical cyclone or hurricane forecast skill, especially for intensity. And over land, we have this ability to do high resolution measurements of inland water. And we're using that to do things like um, imaging waterways and imaging flood inundation after major storms. And that's the, these are the two main areas that we'll be working on in the future with Cygnus. And I think I'll stop here. So thank you very much. Hello? Okay. Thank you, Chris. Yes. It was a very nice and quite interesting presentation. It's quite nice to see what we is discovering how to work with GPS, because GPS was developed for positioning, navigation, and now we can use GPS for several applications. Né? It's a multi-purpose system. Uh, it is quite interesting. Uh, of course, that uh, a lot of questions will rise, but first I'd like to to pass to Felipe Nivinsky to make some initial consideration. Hello, Felipe. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Well, thank you, Chris, for the excellent presentation. Um, just the launch was uh, such an epic uh, feat that uh, it's yeah, I, 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 I'm sure it, uh, for a lot of our students, it, it will keep in their minds for, a, for, for much time. Uh -huh. Yeah, the launch was an exciting day. Yes. Actually, the most exciting, there was five seconds 
after the, the rocket was released from the airplane and before the engine fires is about five seconds and everybody's very, very nervous. Yes, I can imagine in the, in the end science worked, right? <laughs> yes. So uh, that's great. Well, uh, we will be taking the questions from the audience and uh, I, I, I made a, a few here. Uh, and we're trying to, to, to make this more for uh, students to, to get into GNSS uh, reflectometry. Okay. So um, if, you, if you had any, any suggestions or, or, or thoughts on how uh, a graduate student in a remote sensing field could uh, get started on GNSSR, what would you recommend? Well, uh, well, first of all, the data from the Cygnus mission is all publicly available. Anybody can access all of our data. It's very easy to find. It's on a NASA data server. Um, so if you have an interest in working with the data, it's, it's, a, it's readily available. And there's lots of documentation um, uh, about how to use the data and how it's calibrated and some, some um, example software for opening the files and reading them and so on. So that part of it, we've tried to make as easy as possible for anyone who's curious and interested. Um, as far as, you know, what to do with the data, there's, you know, this is a pretty new technique, the GNSSR remote sensing, it's, it's quite new. So there's lots of things that are still not known about how to use the data, the possible science applications, and also the engineering side of how to calibrate the data and how to interpret it. So yeah, there's many, many questions and new areas. I think more so than with most traditional remote sensing techniques that are more mature and have been around for 20 or 30 years um, where there's still a lot of sort of second order corrections to make it better. But, but with GNSSR, there's still some first order unanswered questions. Um, even like the measurements over uh, of the water over land, we don't really we don't really understand what the spatial resolution is. You know, maybe it's 10 meters, maybe it's 50 meters. It's not clear. But even that as an image processing question or signal processing question, understanding what the true native resolution of the measurements is, that's an open engineering question. Yes, you are you are on the diffraction limit right there, right? Uh, well, it's no, it's beyond the diffraction limit. Actually, it's 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 quite a way beyond. It really the reason the spatial resolution is so good. I mean, it relies on the Fresnel zone of the reflections. So it's the it's the phase interference of the different reflecting terms. Um, and uh, yeah, our, our antennas are very small. I mean, the, the diffraction limit for an, our antennas is several hundred kilometers, actually. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, these, the resolution of 10 meters or 50 meters, it's a different phenomenon. And uh, yeah, and it, it's not clear actually what the resolution is, but the pictures are very nice. So it's obviously good. Yeah. It, it works very well. Uh, about the, the interference of the ionosphere and the troposphere, does it make any problem for the analysis or not? It depends on the application. So there's some people on the science team that are working on um, altimetry, using the data for altimetry, because you can time the signal, the GPS signal, and the time of, you know, the propagation time. And from that, you can get the sea level. And with those measurements, the propagation time is changed by the, uh, you know, the uh, integrated electron content of the ionosphere. Right, because yeah. it changes the it changes the refractivity, and you need to know that in order to get an absolute measurement of the sea level. So that's a that's a concern with these measurements that there's a there's an unknown offset due to the ionosphere. For most of the measurements we make, we're interested in the power of the scattering, not the timing for the wind measurements, and then we don't need to know that the uh, propagation time. Okay, let me invite uh, Chris Laine to, to make a question. She has a question. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Chris, for the nice talk. I have a question. Yes. Some Cygnus parameters aren't well estimated, such as the receiver gain, GPS transmitter power, and transmitter and receiver ranges to the specular points. How does it affect the quality of Cygnus me measurements and results, and what are our plans to improve the quality of the observations? 
Right, so we have um, estimates for all of those parameters. Some of them are better and some of them are worse, so there's still room for improvement. Um, but um, I'll mention a few of them. Um, as I said during the talk, the, mag the amplitude of the GPS transmit signal needs to be known. And when we first um, launched Cygnus, we thought that the GPS transmit power would be fairly constant over time, and we were wrong. It actually changes quite a bit, and it changes over very short time periods, tens of seconds. And it's because of the, uh, you know, the, the, the government control of the GPS constellation is by the, the United States Air Force, you know, the military. And they have other applications for GPS, of course, that are not civilian science applications. So they change their power and they turn it up and they turn it down and they move around the different sidebands depending on what part of the world they're over. Um, some parts of the world, they have a lot more problems with interactions with other jamming and things like that, interference. So they turn the power up or they turn it down. So we have to compensate for that. And we, what we did in the second year on orbit, when we started seeing this problem in our science data, we reprogrammed the navigation receiver. We have a GPS navigation receiver that's not for science. It's just to do location of the satellite, you know, conventional GPS. We reprogrammed that so that it could also measure the power of the transmitted signal, the GPS transmit signal. And we now use that to calibrate the science data. It wasn't something we were planning to do, but that's what we're doing now. And that seems to be working okay. And then as far as the, the receiver gain, uh, you know, the, the recalibration of the receiver characterization, you know, characteristics, we, um, we make measurements of the, uh, you know, I showed those delay Doppler maps of the scattering from the ocean surface and the part where you can see the ocean, that's where our science data is but we also have measurements that are far away from the specular point that where there's no scattered power. And we also make measurements there and that's the noise floor of the measurement. And that tells us the receiver gain and the changes in the receiver properties. And that's um, factored into our calibration equation. Uh, hello, Chris. We have some question from the audience. Yes. One of them is, is this system better than Japanese airborne TRMM? Better. Uh, no, it's different. The Japanese TRMM operates at a higher frequency, um, lower uh, wavelength. So they have trouble penetrating through rain, especially heavy rain. So for, for applications where you're trying to make surface measurements under heavy rain, Cygnus has an advantage, okay? But if you're, <clears throat> if you're interested in measuring the rain, like TRMM, it's a, it's a precipitation mission. So they actually want to have interaction with the rain. So they're able to make measurements of the atmosphere, um, which we can't make measurements of the atmosphere at all with Cygnus because the wavelength is so long that there's no significant interaction with rain or cloud. So yeah, TRIM is, a, is optimized as an atmospheric science mission, and we're optimized as a surface imaging mission. Thank you. Yep. Could you make the next question, Felipe, that is on the screen? Yes, sure. Um, so uh, again from uh, YouTube, what are, in our view, the main challenges in soil moisture estimation using uh, this type of observations? In soil moisture, I think, um, so there are a number of groups on the Cygnus science team who are investigating soil moisture retrieval. There's been a series of papers that have started coming out in the last two years. And so, you know, the first order answer is we're able to measure soil moisture and um, it's approximately comparable to the SMAP soil moisture measurement. Um, we, there are secondary influences on the measurement that need to be corrected. And those are really the challenges. The main one is the uh, sensitivity to the surface roughness conditions. You know, because the roughness has a strong impact on our scattering cross-section. I mean, that's why we can measure the wind is because we're sensitive to the roughness. So if we're interested in soil moisture, 
we don't want the uh, the roughness of the surface to influence our soil moisture measurement, and it has a direct influence on the strength of the signal. So there needs to be some way to correct for or compensate for the horizontal, you know, the non non uniform variations in roughness that are not caused by soil moisture. And that's mm -hmm. probably the main the main concern right now. Just to remove the topography from the right, from the right, that's right. So you know, a common way to address this with SMAP, which is something that we're going to try, is once you have a full year of data, so you can look at the full annual cycle, you can customize the retrieval in every pixel, so, so that you come up with a history for that particular pixel, and you have some kind of a roughness map that you can use as a bent, as you know, to calibrate the algorithm individually. So it's something like that is what we're looking at. Thank you, Chris. Chris Land, could you make the, the next one? Sure. Yeah. So, YouTube, do you foresee any application of this technology in precision agriculture, such as in detection of, of insect clouds? I'm sorry, in the in the detection of what? Insect clouds. I Insect clouds. Insect clouds. Um, well, we won't see insects scattering in the air, I don't think. I mean, those, the air, you know, the density of those is small, and also they're generally small. Well, actually, I guess in Brazil, you have some insects that are as big as our wavelength, maybe, but not here, not in the U.S. The, but the insects are smaller. But there's actually um, there's actually one related application, a new Cygnus application, which is really pretty interesting related to insects. Um, this is work that's being done together with uh, the NASA Cygnus team, some other groups at NASA, working with the uh, United Nations. Um, it's the uh, Agriculture AOR, I forget. It's a United Nations organization that works uh, with agricultural support in Africa. So they're working with the Cygnus team and um, we're it's using our soil moisture product. So one nice thing about the Cygnus soil moisture product is it's able to penetrate through heavy vegetation and still give good soil moisture measurements under a, a thick vegetation canopy um, because the wavelength is long enough. It can penetrate through the, 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 le the wet leaves. Um, and uh, there's a certain combination of conditions when you have a lot of soil moisture, you know, you have a moist soil and you have a, a thick vegetation canopy above it, that combination is very conducive to supporting locust outbreaks because locusts, you know, there's a big locust problem right now in East Africa. Um, and locusts, when they first, when the eggs first hatch, there's a period of about three weeks when they can't fly yet. So when they first hatch, the, the soil has to be moist to support the eggs. And then after they hatch, there has to be a lot of vegetation that they're, that's right nearby because they can't fly. So they have to be able to crawl up the trees or whatever to get to the leaves. And, uh, and, then, and then after about three weeks, they can fly and then they dissipate and it's much harder to control. So they're working with the Cygnus team on isolating these locations with a combination of, of high soil moisture, high vegetation, and then they um, are going out to these sites with some eradication. I don't know if it's like spraying poison or something to try to eradicate them before they can start to fly. So that's actually a really exciting application that, um, yeah. yeah, that's just it's just getting started now, working together with the United Nations organization in Africa. So it's related to insects, but not not once they're airborne, it's it's uh, yeah, they're not really visible in our data. Yeah, thank you. We have another question here. Is there a possibility to analyze floods in urban areas? Oh yeah, yeah. That's actually a very active part of what we're doing because the you know the spatial resolution is quite high, tens of meters apparently, and so we can see the motion of the uh, uh, floodwaters like after a major precipitation event from rain on in rivers or with um, hurricane landfalls if they cause floods either way. We can see those changes and the uh, because we have so many satellites, we get new measurements two or three times a day. So you can see the dynamics of the flood moving from, you know, from day to day. And so there's work going on taking those measurements and using them as validation 
for a hydrological flood models, you know, that try to predict where the floods are going to go and using this data as validation. So yeah, that's actually, a, that's an, it's an active part of our study right now. Felipe, could you read the next one? Yes, uh, I had one of my own actually, uh, I'll do yes. that first. So you mentioned about alt altimetry applications and uh, uh, what's your opinion on, on near grazing incidents yes. uh, and, uh, and the trade-offs with uh, occultation and reflectometry? Right, well, the near grazing is actually, I think the much more exciting possibility for GNSSR. And the reason is, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the difference between carrier phase delay and group delay altimetry, those two things. So, you know, the traditional radar radar altimeters like Jason or Topex, they use group delay altimetry where you send out a pulse and then you time it and you measure when it comes back, right? That's the traditional group delay altimetry. And that works fine with the, cusp, with the specialized radar altimeter missions because the pulses have very wide bandwidth. So they have very good vertical resolution and height resolution for the, you know, for the sea height, right? Um, but with GNSSR, the bandwidth is quite low. It's only about four megahertz, the, G, the GPS bandwidth, um, as opposed to about, I think about 300, 350 megahertz for JSON. So it's much poorer vertical resolution. It's of, of order three to five meters vertical resolution. So it's not really useful for any high precision satellite altimetry for ocean oceanography. Mm -hmm. um, but carrier phase altimetry is completely different. It looks at the phase of the carrier, you know, the mm -hmm. 1600 megahertz carrier and looks at changes in the phase to resolve the, uh, the height. And with those, you know, it's, uh, it's proportional to the wavelength. Our wavelength is 19 centimeters. That's one one wavelength. So if you can resolve the phase to 30 or 45 degrees, that means your resolution is about one eighth of a wavelength, a few centimeters. And that is the right order to be able to do precision altimetry. The problem is you can only do carrier phase altimetry if the surface is flat enough to give you clean specular reflections where you can still see the phase of the reflected signal. And that happens almost only at grazing angles because the surface roughness it's what matters is the projected roughness in the direction of propagation not the vertical roughness so the ocean is has a certain roughness scale tens of centimeters or more but when you look at a grazing angle the effective roughness goes down by the secant of the angle of the right so you see you can do a lot of carrier phase altimetry with cygnus at grazing angles that's been demonstrated and then you have the potential for doing, um, you know, centimeter scale altimetry. Um, and how that relates to radio occultation, I think the main way it relates is in order to tune the, optimize the instrument design to work well at grazing angles, it's, you know, in terms of the antenna positioning and the polarization of the antenna, it's almost identical to the way you optimize for radio occultation. So there's a natural complementarity where you could do both science with the same, both of those science goals with the same hardware. Oh, well, that's great. Yeah. We have here a question from Murilo Silva da Silva. Is there an estimate of how many lives can, I, can be saved in this system? How many lives? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't that's know. Great. Uh, I haven't, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I hope the answer is many. Uh, Felipe, any more questions? Chris Lane? Um, Chris? I have, I have one more. Yes. Yes. Each signal satellite has four channels and therefore, therefore can measure when four simultaneous reflections at a time. So I'm sure that many other reflections reach the satellite antenna. So. How do the satellite instruments select which observation will be processed? And do you have any plans to improve the satellite's capabilities in terms of the number of observations? Right. Um, okay, so yeah, so there's an onboard processor on each satellite that has a list of all the GPS satellites um, that are available, right? And it calculates where the specular points are for each one. There's usually between six and 10 
possible specular points that it can see at any given time. And it looks at each one of them and where they are on the ground, and in particular, where they are in the Cygnus antenna pattern. And it selects the four that are have the highest antenna pattern gain. Those will give us the strongest signals. So it's constantly doing that selection algorithm all the time and choosing which ones to use. Okay, so that's the way that's the way the current one works. There's a new Cygnus receiver development effort. It started about four years ago, and it's actually just finishing now. We have a new receiver that we've developed that has more modern electronics, better gate array. It can handle about 20 channels simultaneously, and it can also handle both GPS and Galileo, the European GNSS, and Beidou, the Chinese one, and GLONASS, the Russian one. So it has all those channels in included in its capability, plus it's just a bigger, bigger processor, so it can do 20 simultaneously, and it'll have a similar sort of algorithm to look at all the different possibilities and choose the, the ones to assess. And that, um, that instrument, it's going through its final laboratory testing right now here, here in Michigan. And we have plans um, in next May, hopefully, if the COVID thing starts to go away, we have plans. We're, we're collaborating with the New Zealand Space Agency right now um, and Air New Zealand, the commercial airline in New Zealand, where they're going to let us install one of uh, our instruments on one of their airplanes uh, permanently. So it'll be on an Air New Zealand airplane flying all the time, and we'll have automatic uh, an automatic uh, link through a cell phone to this from this airplane to the ground at the University of Auckland, and then from there through the internet to uh, Michigan to collect lots of data with this new instrument to test out the operation and make sure it's working okay. And also, it'll be going um, the northern part of New Zealand is inside of the Cygnus coverage. Because Cygnus can only go to about 39 degrees south latitude. So there's a, a little bit of overlap with northern New Zealand. So we'll also have some intercalibration with Cygnus. And this will be a way for us to test out all the new capabilities of the new receiver. And then eventually we want to try to get it on a new satellite mission. Um, but that's not confirmed yet. That's just a hope. Okay, thank you. Uh, Felipe, any final comments? We, the time is fly quite quickly yeah i think we're it's about time to finish i just uh, had one quick question uh how far do you see us from a commercial sector exploitation it's kind of already happening i mean there's a company spire the, the company spire they have launched uh two gnssr satellites already they're up there now and they're still doing their testing and demonstration, demonstrating the technology and so on and starting to do some science, you know, wind measurements and soil moisture measurements. They started doing that. And um, I know the people that, at the company very well. Actually, some of them used to be part of the Cygnus team, but then this private company offered them more money or something. <laughs> so now they're doing the private version. And uh, so they, uh, you know, the, the senior management of that company believes that this is a reasonable business investment to try to do uh, GNSSR satellites and then um, sell sell the data. I guess they want to sell the data. I'm not sure what their what the uh, the business model is, but this is something that they're investing in as a private investment. So maybe it's already happening. Okay, thank you very much. We have to close this session. Okay, I'd like to say. Thank you very much, Chris. It was a very nice presentation, a very nice discussion. Uh, thank you, Felipe Nivinsky, for taking part of this, uh, this talk here together with Chris Lane. It was a, a big pleasure to stay with you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Yeah, it was my pleasure. I enjoyed it very much. Maybe next time I'll visit um, Brazil for a time. You have to. You, you are Someday. invited. You, this this pandemic finish, you are welcome to visit us. Thank you. Thank you. Chris. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank bye, you. bye.